joining us now. Uh, Mr. Bajaj, let me begin by asking you the key growth drivers for the company in Q2. Uh, the stock has performed uh, exceptionally well. What are some of the growth drivers you see and uh, the drivers that you will continue exploiting in the coming months? Hello, Parikshit. Thank you. Um, you know, when you ask me this question, my mind goes back to what I think was the best decade for Bajaj Auto, which was 2001 to 2011. You know, those those 10 years that actually started with the launch of the Pulsar in uh, November 2001. So I, uh, when I reflect on that, uh, it occurs to me that we did some things really right uh, over those 10 years. You know, we introduced the Pulsar, which was fantastic. Um, it changed motorcycling in this country. Um, we introduced uh, KTM um, uh, to this country through our partnership with them. Um, we uh, acted upon the Chetak, which was the ICE Chetak at that time, uh, but in the sense that we stopped uh, making scooters uh, in our endeavor to focus on being a global motorcycle company. Um, we expanded our three-wheeler, not only in terms of distribution, but also on the back of uh, new technology at that time, particularly for CNG, um, because uh, it was led by Mrs. Dixit in Delhi, who wanted uh, you know Delhi to be cleaner. Uh, and then finally, of course, that was the decade when we uh, commenced on our export journey. I mean, in 2001, our exports were close to zero. Uh, and 10 years later, they were probably, I mean, I don't know, maybe half a million or a million a year. Uh, and the reason I give you these uh, uh, five uh, data points is because I think what has gone right for us uh, in recent years is exactly more of the same. You know, once again, uh, the Pulsar in its new avatar is doing really well. Uh, this time, as opposed to KTM, we also have uh, Triumph joining us. The Chetak is back uh, in an electric avatar. Um, the three-wheeler again on the back of CNG and now the electric three-wheelers is uh, really doing well, as you know. And finally, uh, exports after having, you know, dipped uh, a little bit, uh, slowly coming back. And as you know, we are the largest exporter out of India. So I think we are firing on all these five cylinders again simultaneously. And that's perhaps what the market is appreciating. All right. So you're saying uh, just doing what uh, the brand has been doing very well with the Pulsar, with the KTM, with the Chetak, with the Triumph, with the three wheelers and the exports. And that remains your strategy going forward. Uh, how has been the festive season for uh, Bajaj? And how do you expect the company to do domestically in Q3 uh, also because of the wedding season? So, uh, as far as the festive season is concerned, uh, let me tell you vertical by vertical, our domestic motorcycle vertical for the Bajaj motorcycles. Um, uh, if I compare the October-November period this year uh, with the same period last year, because that would be a fair comparison, uh, then overall, uh, the Bajaj motorcycle growth is uh, about 20% in retail terms. Um, and uh, But within that, the mix is very interesting. On the 100cc, which has seen a lot of discounting in the marketplace, uh, not by us, um, we are actually down 10% year on year. So we have a degrowth of 10%. Mm. But in the 125cc plus area, uh, which we like to refer to as the sports motorcycling area, um, and which is the uh, area of our focus, uh, believe it or not, our growth is as high as almost 50% year on year. You know, so that's how the blended average comes to 20% or 22%. Uh, and obviously, this is very good for us because that's the area of our strength. That is more the EBITDA supportive area, if not the EBITDA uh, accretive area. Uh, and that's where our focus will continue to be. On our pro biking vertical, which handles uh, KTM and Triumph, also we have similar like 50% growth, uh, which is to be expected because there was no Triumph last year. Um, on the Chetak, um, you know, we have moved very strongly uh, in, in the last two months from uh, number four to a uh, pretty strong number three position. And if you look at the Vahan data now, uh, as of today, mm -hmm. you will see that we are close to 15% market share, which was only about 5% just a few months back. Mm -hmm. So Chetak has done really well for us. Um, on the three-wheeler, we've had two months of record-breaking sale in the domestic market, exceeding 50,000 a month. Uh, I personally never thought uh, that in my tenure at Bajaj, I will ever see the three wheelers selling 50,000 a month for almost 80% market share. Mm. And on the exports also, we have some share because, uh, you know, typically 
before the uh, kind of crisis in several global markets, we mm. used to export about 200,000 units every month. This had dipped to almost 100,000, come back to about 130, 140,000. And I think now we are going to see 150, 160,000. So again, you know, uh, very good news on all the five fronts in the festive season. I think this is going to continue uh, for the rest of this financial year mm. um, uh, in a similar fashion. All right. Uh, let me uh, also ask you about the Triumph. You, you sold about 8,000 units of the Triumph in Q2. How do you see the production ramp up, uh, the sales footprint of the Triumph motorcycles? Now you've got the Scrambler also in the market. So we are uh, taken a little bit by surprise, I must admit. Uh, we had prepared ourselves for 5,000 a month because, you know, uh, primarily the market leader there, Royal Enfield, is, is a very tall and very deep uh, brand. Um, and, uh, you know, all of us have tried uh, over and over again in recent years, but nobody's really been able to make an impact. Mm -hmm. So our initial capacity, as I had shared with you previously, was for 5,000 a month. Um, and yes, last quarter we have done, I think, uh, 8,000 totally. This quarter, I think we should more than double that uh, to about 18,000, which means an average of 6,000. So out of a capacity of 5,000 a month, we will hopefully be able to uh, squeeze out 6,000 triumphs uh, on an average every month this quarter. Not easy with all the uh, Diwali break, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, that is a mix of uh, both domestic and exports of both the Roadster and the Scrambler. And going forward, uh, you know, obviously the next stop uh, should be 10,000 a month. And I think we are looking good for that. Uh, I must say that apart from expanding capacity, we also have to expand distribution. Because as you know, Triumph has its own exclusive network. We inherited about 14 or 16 dealers from Triumph. I think we might have about 25 dealers now, you know, versus let's say 1,000 for Royal Enfield or 800 for Bajaj. So, we still have a long way to go before uh, we establish the required uh, distribution footprint. Mm. Uh, so as capacity and distribution expand, mm. I think we will see this number expand. All right. Uh, so you're saying that you look to really double production and sales of uh, the Triumph from 8,000 in Q2 to about 18,000 in Q3. Uh, so strong numbers there. I'd like to ask you about uh, ramping up uh, sales of the Chetak as well, 7,261 units in October, 11% uh, market share for Bajaj currently. How are you working to increase the market share here onwards and some of the strategies you would be deploying? Oh, well, uh, as I said, we are now uh, averaging about 15% uh, market share at a Vahan level. Uh, I suspect retail market share is a little ahead of that. As you know, Vahan takes a few weeks to catch up uh, uh, with, the, with the retail data. Uh, so the retail gives us uh, a lot of confidence. We are now averaging about uh, 10,000 a month uh, on average. Uh, again, uh, we were constrained by capacity. Uh, and uh, I guess the next logical step uh, for Chetak is, uh, I would say, uh, 20,000 a month for, a, let's say, 20% share. You know? So uh, 2020 uh, should be uh, the next stop for Chetak. How are we going to do this? Uh, well, the old-fashioned way, uh, we have to, again, like Triumph, we have to expand production capacity, which should be done within this quarter uh, to the level of 20,000. We have, again, an exclusive network uh, for Chetak, um, and uh, we have to grow that network, and we are working on that. There are still uh, some large markets uh, where we are underrepresented. Hmm. And finally, there has to be excitement for the consumer. Hmm. Um, so um, I'm happy to say that very soon, by which I mean as soon as perhaps uh, next month, you will see uh, some uh, new products in the marketplace um, uh, under the Chetak brand. Mm. And uh, so certainly that should, uh, you know, further uh, uh, intensify demand. And hopefully from January, uh, both in terms of capacity and distribution, we are able to do something more than 10,000 a month and we are on our way to 20,000 a month. Right. So by uh, the end of Q3, you're saying that you would have a production capacity of 20,000 units for the Chetak. Uh, that is correct. Right. Uh, in terms of taking the market share, uh, currently you've got uh, uh, Ola, which is at about 35%. Uh, would, do you think, uh, by when do you think you'll be able to probably reach a higher market share in the range of 30%? No, no, Parikshit, unlike me, you have not done your homework. Ola was down to 30% already in, in October. I think if you look at the um, data, uh, again, I'm talking about the Vahan data, uh, which is available to everyone. Uh, 
uh, and uh, uh, if you look at the recent Vahan data as of like yesterday or day before, uh, the data that I saw suggested that uh, the top three players had a market share of uh, uh, Ola 23%, TVS 20% and Bajaj at 15%. Hmm. So I think the top three are now pretty close. Hmm. Uh, of course, this can change, uh, you know. Uh, uh, there is so much activity there in the market in terms of uh, new products, in terms of prices changing, mm. etc. So it could go either way. But mm. as of now, this is how um, uh, you know the three stand in the marketplace. Right. Uh, in terms of exporting the Cheta, taking it to global markets, what's the plan, Mr. Bajaj? Uh, you know, quite frankly, I think Rakesh is in a better position to answer that. And uh, since he's been away for a, for a bit, I am not... Uh, updated on that. I do know that uh, he has uh, two or three markets in mind. Uh, I don't think anything is concluded yet, but I will say this, that this is, uh, you know, India is the most important market for electric vehicles of this kind, particularly. Hmm. I mean, uh, I don't know if you're aware that uh, apparently China sold 59 million electric two-wheelers last year. Hmm. But then a lot of them were the small, cheap kind of stuff hmm. that I don't think we really want to see in this country. Hmm. Uh, so uh, stuff that is of the standard of the Chetak, by which I mean the design standard, the quality standard and the service standard for which the Chetak is being appreciated today. Um, you know, India is the most important market. So quite frankly, uh, you know, even if we just focused on this market for the next five years, uh, that itself would offer tremendous growth uh, for this brand. So no immediate plans for exports? No. Okay. Uh, let me uh, also speak to you about your CNG strategy. In September, you had hinted to us that you're working on a CNG motorcycle. Uh, what is the current status of that plan, uh, of that pilot? Because there have been reports that you have you've been testing this and could be possibly uh, launched next year. Could you give us a sense of the CNG plans? Sure. So yes, it's no secret that we are working on a CNG uh, two wheeler, um, uh, and uh, the uh, apparently the prototype of the motorcycle has been spotted. Uh, uh, I haven't seen those details, so I'm not going to comment on that. Um, as I had shared with you, this is something we thought of recently and as the proto itself would suggest in case uh, that is authentic, we are in very early stages of the game. So what I'm prepared to say today is that this is not something we are about to launch, uh, you know, uh, in this year or something like that. Uh, but I'm prepared to say that within the calendar year 25, uh, which means uh, within the next two years, we would certainly hope uh, I would not say we have decided to, but we are very hopeful of uh, launching this motorcycle. And let me tell you why primarily, Prakshit. You know, there doesn't exist a CNG two-wheeler in the world today, to the best of my knowledge. Unless, you know, there is some uh, Jugaad stuff happening somewhere, as there is in India also. I am told people retrofit uh, CNG onto their scooters and motorcycles. And there's very good reasons for this. And let me give you four of the top reasons. Mm. Uh, the first three have to do uh, with emissions and hence with your health and my health. Mm. Uh, let's start with uh, carbon dioxide, CO2, which as we know is very important for global warming. Mm. Now, when we made the prototype, and compared the CNG motorcycle mm. with the ICE motorcycle, the petrol motorcycle, mm. there is an almost 50% reduction in CO2. Next, carbon monoxide, which we know is very hazardous for mm. human health. Mm. There is a 75% reduction in mm. carbon monoxide. Mm. And finally, in terms of non-methane hydrocarbons, mm. uh, you know, obviously with CNG, that is almost zero. So in fact, there is a 90% reduction. And in terms of the operating cost, which is, of course, more important for the Aam Admi customer, if I may call him that, uh, than is the emission consideration, for better or worse, mm. uh, there is almost a 50 to 65 percent reduction mm. um, in the operating cost in terms of the fuel bill. Uh, you know, so it's, it's effectively like saying petrol instead of 110 rupees a liter is suddenly going to become 50 rupees a liter. And I think the proof of the pudding is in what has happened in the three-wheeler industry, for example. Mm. Of yeah. course, CNG has become very popular even with cars and buses. Right. Uh, but, you know, especially so with the three wheels. Right. So, I, I'd quickly like to confirm, you said uh, you're working towards a launch, a commercial launch in 2025 calendar year for the CNG motorcycle. 
Yeah, I said before the end of the 2025 calendar year. Before, That's right. Okay, before the end of the 2025 calendar year. Uh, what do market studies really reveal? Bajaj Auto must be doing market studies. What is the demand for a CNG motorcycle in the market? Because uh, people have traditionally bought uh, petrol motorcycles. Now there are customers moving towards electric vehicles. Uh, what do market studies really reveal? It's very hard to uh, uh, do anything more than speculate, but let me give you a somewhat longish answer to this. Let's take reference of the three-wheeler market, uh, which is as close as we can get to the two-wheeler market right now. Mm. You may be surprised to know that with the government's initiative mm. in rapidly expanding the CNG pipeline in recent years, and that's one wonderful thing I would say the government has done mm. uh, as far as the auto industry is concerned. Uh, today, almost 60% of the three-wheeler industry has moved to CNG, you know, with the commensurate benefits, as we just spoke, uh, for the environment and also for the operating cost for the driver and for the customers. Uh, you know, so, and within the Bajaj portfolio, uh, and we just finished saying how well Bajaj has been doing with its three-wheelers, uh, you know, 70% of what we sell today, uh, you know, uh, passenger and cargo uh, put together, is CNG. So that's one uh, data point. Uh, as far as the uh, two-wheeler industry is concerned, or let's take just the motorcycle industry because that's what we are working on. Mm. You know, pre-COVID, our industry used to be about a million a month. Mm. Now it is between 800 and 900,000. So we have still not come back to the pre-COVID levels. And mm. I'll come back to this point in mm. a second. Um, you know, if you were to apply 70% to that, that would be a huge number. But I'm saying even if 10, 20% people uh, would consider uh, CNG. You're talking of a very large number of motorcycles. You're talking of probably 200,000 motorcycles every month at, mm. at a 20% uh, uh, conversion. You know? mm. But here I must make two important points if you will give me two minutes to do that. Mm. And that is I want to make a statement that our industry and two-wheelers in this country has really suffered in recent times not so much you know, because of the COVID lockdown, not so much because of commodity price increases, uh, not so much because of the chips and ship shortage, as it has uh, for the fact that it is over-regulated and over-taxed. Mm. You know, by over-regulation, I draw your attention to the fact that I have been saying this for the last three, four years now, and I believe I have heard Venu sir say this, I have heard Bhargav Sahib say this, mm. that, uh, you know, in terms of the regulations brought in for emission safety and insurance, mm. it has pushed up the cost of an average motorcycle by about 35%. Mm. And today... Uh, our uh, safety norms in terms of mandating ABS or emission norms in terms of BS6 put us squarely on par with European norms. Mm. Now, that's good. I mean, if you want to benchmark the best in the world and be there, no problem. You know, I mean, we have the technology to do it. We are a global player. But then right. we must also understand that there is a huge commercial implication of that mm. on what is essentially the vehicle of the Aam Admi for his daily commute and to earn his daily livelihood. Mm. And that brings me to the point of this being a heavily overtaxed market. Mm. You know, the third biggest two-wheeler market in the world after China and India mm. is typically Brazil. Yeah. Uh, you would be surprised to know perhaps that just as our GST is 28%, mm. it is only 9.25% in Brazil. Mm. You know, the next biggest market is Indonesia. Mm. It is only 11% in Indonesia. Mm. In Philippines, which is you know, as rich or poor a market as ours, it is only 12%. Mm. In Malaysia and um, in Vietnam, it is only 10%. Mm. And in Thailand, uh, we all love Thailand, you know, so in Thailand, it's only 7%. So very clearly, mm. the Aam Admi in India is being made to pay, on an average, I would say, about 15% more in taxation terms than his counterpart in all of these economies, which I think are very comparable to us. So... Excuse me, I think that uh, what is very important uh, is that when new technology is introduced, whether for safety or emission, mm. or say in this case CNG, at the same time, mm. we need to relook at the GST structure. If we want industry to grow, if we want India to continue to be a powerhouse of two wheelers in the world, and if we want employment to grow. Right. So, uh, so you, again, uh, you are asking for a reduction in GST, simplification of regulatory costs as well. Uh, Coming back to importance of CNG motorcycles for your portfolio, how much are you investing currently in uh, having a CNG portfolio in the two-wheeler segment? 
the honest answer, Parikshit, is that I don't know because, as I said, that our work has just started. So, you know, uh, what uh, demand should we anticipate? What share for ourselves? Uh, what make by policy we will follow? Uh, hence, what investment we will make? I think it's uh, too early to answer these questions. Right now, we are focused on uh, getting the product right. Right. Uh, in terms of uh, how it would contribute to your revenues, the kind of portfolio mix that you're looking at, how many uh, CNG products would you like to have? What would be the sales mix that you're working towards? Well, in terms of uh, uh, revenues, again, as I said, it's too early for that, but I would put it like this, that uh, if we can have 20% penetration in uh, through CNG two-wheelers, let's say uh, in a couple of years after they are introduced, and that points to uh, say 200,000 uh, units a month or thereabouts. And you know, typically in this space, uh, uh, we have 40% market share. So let's say arbitrarily we will have you know share of 80,000 vehicles a month, which is a million vehicles a year. Multiply that by a price which is likely to be around a lakh of rupees, let's say. So it points to a potential revenue stream of uh, 10,000 crores a year. But I would say this is all pie in the sky at this stage. Uh, it is not easy to package a large CNG, uh, CNG cylinder in a two-wheeler, especially in a motorcycle, which has no space, actually, unlike a scooter under the seat. Mm. So there's a reason why there doesn't exist a CNG two-wheeler in the world as of now. Uh, in, in a three-wheeler or in a car or a bus, uh, that, that challenge doesn't exist. Mm. So again, we have to first get the product right, and then we will know better about the cost and price and potential volumes and revenues. Okay, uh, the final question on the CNG front. There have been reports that uh, you would like to probably bring this in the 150cc. Uh, uh, bringing it in Pulsar, would that be your aspiration? Uh, obviously, I'm not enough of a rookie to give you a straight answer to that. But I will say this, that I believe that with new technologies, you know, uh, whether it's electric or CNG, mm. uh, it is uh, important that uh, it is not just the technology, i.e. the product that is new, but it should also be the position or the brand also that is new. And that is why, for example, when we have brought the Chetak back after mm. 15 years of, uh, you know, burying it, so to speak, mm. we have brought it back in a pure electric avatar. Mm. And a lot of people tell me that, uh, you know, side by side, why not also have a ice Chetak? And I just think it will take the uh, charm away from it. You know, imagine a, a gasoline Tesla standing next to a EV Tesla. I mean, it just sounds like a very corrupt thought. So in the same way, my first instinct would be to say that if we are going to introduce the world's first CNG motorcycle, hopefully, uh, you know, TVS is not going to beat us to it. Um, uh, I would like to think that we will create a new position with a new brand mm. uh, rather than leverage one of our existing brands. All right. Uh, my final two questions, Mr. Bajaj. Uh, what would be your aspiration currently in terms of revenue, profit margins uh, over the next few years with the old uh, motorcycles, the ICE portfolio continuing, and the new uh, generation electric vehicles, CNG, and other fuels uh, also coming in? Well, I can't give you again a quantitative answer to that, uh, but I will uh, share one thought with you qualitatively, uh, largely, which is this that, you know, India used to be till uh, the early 90s a scooter country, so to speak, you know, 70% of the market was scooters. Mm. Um, and then, you know, for reasons of fuel economy, because motorcycles, four-stroke motorcycles, especially were much more fuel efficient than uh, scooters were, mm. uh, the country became a 70% motorcycle market. Now, if we are going to go down the EV route, uh, and, you know, there is so much uncertainty, as you know, with fame and PLI and so many other things. But let's assume for a moment mm. that um, EVs are here to stay and they will grow. Although so far penetration, you know that penetration is only about 5% with two wheelers and perhaps 1% with cars. Mm. But if we go down the EV route, then really there is no advantage left, mm. uh, no significant advantage left with motorcycles as there is in the ice world. Because whether you're a scooter or a motorcycle, with the same EV drivetrain, you're going to have the same cost, the same range, the same charging time, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So, uh, okay, some people will prefer a motorcycle for the larger wheels or just for the feeling of being on a motorcycle. Mm. But I think in this case, it would not be entirely incorrect uh, to hazard mm. that India could go back to being 70%. Uh, a scooter country. Um, and if that were to happen, 
then the uh, revenue opportunity for a company like Bajaj and a brand like Chetak is enormous mm. because then it means that uh, Chetak and of course we could add other brands to it. I can share with you that we are going to work uh, on electric uh, KTM scooters and Husqvarna scooters hopefully not in the a very distant future but for the moment we'll stay with what is uh, real and tangible which is the Chetak that you know Chetak alone could become as it was once as big a company if not bigger than what Bajaj Auto is today mm -hmm. so if Bajaj Auto today is uh, on the threshold of becoming a 50,000 crore company by revenue because that's the question you asked uh, with a 20% EBITDA I see no reason why in principle uh, that should not be true for Chetak uh, or that should not be a real possibility for Chetak, uh, let's say, in the next few years. Right. Uh, so you're saying that the Chetak itself could be a, a big company or maybe even bigger than uh, Bajaj yeah. Auto in future. Uh, my, my final question to you, Mr. Bajaj, would be about the Make in India initiative, which began in 2014. Do you think uh, we have reached a breakthrough moment when it comes to Indian manufacturing? And has India's image shifted from a mere consumer market to a global manufacturing powerhouse? Well, um, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but I will uh, try and answer it in two parts. First of all, as far as uh, being a uh, manufacturer is concerned in India, I would uh, simply put it like this, Parikshit, that uh, you know what is important to us is uh, as a manufacturer is simply the ease of doing business. Hmm. As I've said to you once in the past, you know the five L's of land, of labor, mm. of uh, uh, legislation, of uh, logistics and electricity. You know, these are the five basic elements and then there are some more. Uh, I would only say that, uh, you know, when I compare uh, with uh, the ease of doing business in some of the other global markets of ASEAN uh, or LATAM, I do feel that we still have a long way to go. You know, particularly if we are referencing becoming a powerhouse, uh, as you say, then that implies we must be best in class. Mm. And we are certainly not best in class. Uh, and we were uh, challenged uh, even before 2014, when there was no cry for make in India. I mean, uh, our journey as a global uh, uh, motorcycle maker, as I told you, started uh, from around 2002. So we didn't wait for anyone to tell us uh, to make in India. Uh, we were proactive about it. But with the ease of business, doing business, before 2014, after 2014, at least from my perspective, uh, you know, is no different. It's largely the same. So that is as far as being a manufacturer is concerned. Mm. But in terms of uh, what I would like to read between the lines of your question is that from going, uh, from being merely a producer to kind of becoming a provider of a global brand, uh, I think there is a growing uh, sense of confidence. There is a growing sense of awareness. Mm -hmm. I certainly would like to believe Bajaj has done it, done its bit for that. Today we are in almost 90 countries. Mm -hmm. uh, in many of them, uh, we are uh, the market leader. Mm -hmm. In um, a majority of them, we are either number one or number two. In Africa, for example, across the continent, one out of three motorcycles is a Bajaj motorcycle. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Bajaj exports uh, or sells half of all KTM sold worldwide. Uh, and exports them to US, Europe and Japan. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure there are so many other, I mean, I don't want to make this a sales talk for Bajaj. There are so many other Indian companies who are similarly doing great work, not only in terms of product, but in terms of brand, which means you sell in your name and you sell with pricing power uh, across the world. Uh, so I think that shift has certainly happened in the last few years. But again, we have a long way to go and here the responsibility lies not with the government, it lies with the companies, with their managements and with their strategies. Uh, th that's right. Uh, also, uh, Mr. Bajaj, uh, thank you so much for joining us on the program and uh, giving thank us your views on the growth story for uh, the Bajaj Auto brand. Uh, what next for the Chetak as well? Thank you once again. Thank you, Parikshu. Pleasure. Sir, if you could just hold on for a second, I'll just record.